So uh, my name is Greg Jordan. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about graph databases and kind of the trend uh, towards the, the usage of them. Uh, I do have some ground rules for the presentation. Uh, I do not need your undivided attention. If you got to email people, you got to get up, walk around, stretch, do what you got to do. Ask questions as they come to you. Don't wait. If I don't recognize you, just throw your hand up, start yelling Greg, and, and I'll look up. Uh, and I curse sometimes, so it's not reflexive. I don't just start spouting curse words. It's more just for emphasis. So if that offends anybody, I'm really fucking sorry. Um, so yeah, uh, obligatory credential slide here. Um, I'm manager of web development at Methodist Laboner Healthcare. Uh, they know I cuss too. Um, I'm a PhD candidate. I'm studying qualitative usability. So it, everybody familiar with qualitative versus quantitative? More observation than surveys and things like that. Um, and I have 15 years of programming experience. So I've spent a lot of time on the front, front end working with designers, looking at usability, looking at it in terms of you know, how things work, and also a lot of time on the back end as well. Uh, but more importantly, I've been working with Neo4j, one of the uh, graph databases that's available for about two years. Um, the author of the uh, upcoming book called Practical Neo4j, uh, it's going to be with A Press, and it's probably going to be September, something like that. If you want to email me, uh, I might be able to get you an advanced copy if you're interested. Uh, that address is probably for the best. If you can make up my Twitter handle on the side over there, it's GM Jordan. Uh, but that email address would probably be the best. Uh, here's the feedback, obligatory feedback and social handles. So getting into the meat of the presentation, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we got here, specifically why NoSQL is such a, a good option right now. And just as a show of hands, who's using a NoSQL product of any sort? Who gets paid to use a NoSQL product? Okay, a couple of hands stayed up, good. Um, Anybody using a graph database for anything? Okay. What are you guys using? Titan. Titan? Okay. Yours? Okay, good. Okay. There you go. Well, keep me honest today. Um, so the categories of NoSQL, we're going to, for contrast, comparison, uh, we'll look at four categories and where kind of graph fits in there. Uh, why you should care about graphs, when they make sense, when they don't. Uh, just a quick peek at implementation options, a word about security, and a few caveats. And I'm going to tempt the demo gods and try to do a little bit of, uh, of their web UI. So, um, anybody seen this slide? Before? Okay, good. There's at least one person that's seen it. So, um, and this comic strip is important for a couple of reasons. One, it kind of explores some of the FUD that's out there with NoSQL, but it's it's still pretty relative. Um, they're asking. It's one coworker here asking, "How do I query the database?" Says you can't. It's not a database. It's a key value store. Okay, it's not a database, how do I query it? Oh, you read a distributed MapReduce function in Erlang. Did you just tell me to go fuck myself? <laughs> yeah, I believe I did, Bob. So yeah, so there's blinding complexity that's mixed in the distributed MapReduce function. The other bit is something like this. Some of you all may have seen it. Uh, if you have time today, if you have not seen MongoDB as web scale, watch the whole thing and you'll get the other half of the FUD that's out there on NoSQL. But the fact is, it's happening, right? All of these things are part of speculative retailer applications, and they make sense in certain instances. So where you have financial data staying in the relational database, you might have Neo4j providing recommendations. The other reason it's happening is because of the scale of growth. So you see here in 2010, there's only about 1,200 exabytes, and 2015, we're looking at close to 8,000. Um, I guess half of that's probably the NSA, so we can rule some of that out. Uh, but the same thing kind of going on, on the mobile side. Again, probably half of it NSA. So we have NSA fans in the crowd, I guess. All right. So the other reason we got here in, ter in terms of connectedness, if some of you may remember, uh, the web used to just be hyperlink documents. And then Google and Bing came along and a few others, and they started connecting those with some algorithms in terms of their relevancy. And then Web 3.0, or whatever you want to call it, you have content that's preferred by you based on other things you've looked at, based on what demographic group you, you fit in, those types of things. So that's more or less where we are today. We're actually a little bit further than that. And if anybody knows who comes up with Web 2.0 and 3.0, if you can 
contact them and tell them to stop with the iterations. I'd rather just have something else. Um, semi-structured data is another reason we're here. Uh, for those of you that do development, do application development, you'll be very familiar with this one down here. When the business comes to you and says, hey, we have a form and it has a couple things in it, and then they come back a week later and say, there's two fields that we told you about. Yeah, we got to take those out. So that happens in a waterfall mode. That happens in agile mode. But it happens enough to where the, the business can change their mind, right? So we need semi-structured data. That's another reason NoSQL is here. And of course, there's the architecture side. Some of you may, uh, may remember the DBAs. Are DBAs in, still around? The database asshole? Anybody know? OK. So this guy, gal, handled, it was basically the guardian, right? It was not very flexible, change not easy. 2000s come along, DBA is still managing things, a little more flexible. Uh, changes still require some overhead. But today, we, again, we have rapidly evolving needs, and structure's got to be flexible. The DBA can't stand guard in front of the data. We need the coders, developers, and even part of the business out there changing the model as kind of they need, uh, need to change it. And just a quick word on NoSQL. Most of you mean, uh, no, it does not mean never SQL or no to SQL. When you do that, I look a little bit like that. If you can see uh, Picard there, it's not, it's not coming in very well. You may be able to see that one a little bit better. That's sometimes the rage face that I show. When you do it like this, then I get happy Picard going on. So yeah, it is not only SQL. It does not replace relational databases. But it does make sense in a number of cases. So scale, horizontal scale makes sense. Uh, there's a simpler data model that's available. Uh, schemaless, you don't need normalization ne uh, necessarily. And again, it's coder friendly. And as I mentioned, it does not replace relational databases. I get in a lot of arguments about how it might take over things. I don't know where some of those arguments come from. So categories of NoSQL, real quick. Anybody using Dynamo or React? Okay. So it's essentially large skinny tables, hash maps, right? So pretty straightforward. The strengths there is a simple data model, great at scaling horizontally. Obviously, Amazon puts a lot of effort into Dynamo. So, But you might start to sense a theme here in terms of the weaknesses. So the data model is simplistic, so you have challenges with complex data. You can achieve the connectedness that you need, but you're probably going to do a lot more programming than you want. Column family, anybody using Cassandra, HBase? Okay, a couple. Good, good. Again, there's a lot of strengths here. It's highly scalable, no single point of failure. The idea behind it was it was kind of the original use case for lots of data, the, the big data theme. Uh, and it started with Bigtable from Google. Um, but like the other three you'll see, connected data, you can manage it, you can program for it, but it's just not the best fit. Anybody using Mongo, Couch, okay. So same thing here. Uh, here's the models, collection of documents, keys and values inside of a document. Simple data model, scalability, those things obviously great strengths. Uh, and it is probably the most popular NoSQL option that's out there, Mongo is. Uh, but connected data, you can do it again, but you're probably going to do a little bit more programming than other options. So and that leaves us with graph databases. So somebody mentioned Titan. Okay, so Titan's an option out there. Um, it has acidity. That's one of its strengths, but you have to use the Berkeley DB as the back end, as I understand. Uh, highly connected data for all of those examples, as you'll see in a little bit, um, are its big strengths. Relationships have first class status. It's not kind of just part of the design. It is the main thing for the design. So you have nodes with properties. So you can think of a node as an object, so a person with a first name, last name. And then there's typed relationships. That's explicit with Neo4j and not too sure about Titan. Uh, OrientDB is kind of a multi-model. It mixes graph for some things and then document stores for other things. But we're going to spend probably most of the discussion on Neo4j. So um, possibly one of the weaknesses is much different conceptually, and it really doesn't have a, at one point, I guess they did have a common, uh, common way to do querying, but that's kind of fragmenting a little bit. 
and Neo4j is spending a lot of time on their uh, querying language called Cypher that may make it out into the rest of the graph world, but we'll see. So when I've given this presentation before, I've been asked to do a little bit of graph theory and maybe even touch on graph algebra a little bit. So um, Leonard Euler here, uh, the father of graph algebra. We won't do too deep of a dive. We're not going to do Algebra 101 here, but just to give you a little bit of theory. Um, does anybody know what this is? So this is, okay, thanks, Rob, thank you. This is Seven Bridges of Konigsberg, and essentially this is the first, this is part of the first theorem in graph theory. And those ovals you see there are the bridges that connect the mainland and the island. And the problem here is you need to walk over each bridge, can't retrace your steps, um, without going over any bridge more than once. So uh, Euler, it, you know, we had a bunch of philosophers going around, you know, trying to prove it, walk, actually walking through the bridges. And Euler took a different approach. It was more empirical, um, being a mathematician, and he essentially figured out the main uh, elements of this are the bridges and the, and the uh, masses of land. And um, coincidentally, he proved it uh, could not be proved, but uh, the um, Allied forces uh, came in in World War II and blew up two of the bridges, so now it can be proved. Uh, but you actually have to start on the mainland to do it, so uh, it only makes sense if you live there and if you're a tourist, I guess you could do it too. So this is how he kind of boiled it down, right? The circles there uh, represent uh, what are known as vertices, and then the lines represent the relationships, represent edges, and that's commonly known as a graph. You may have seen uh, pictures with bars and numbers above them. Those are charts. That is a graph. And this is kind of how it looked like inside of Neo4j, right? Especially in the latest version. Uh, they have a concept called labels. They didn't have this before. So this allows you to create more of a schema when you're creating objects inside of the graph. So you'd have a label called person. It would get assigned an ID and maybe have a property named Greg. Then you'd have a relationship. And this is what I was talking about with typed relationships, right? You get to define the name of the relationship where Greg works at a business called Graph Story. So I mentioned there's a trend. And uh, in coming up with some sort of trend and being a qualitative guy, I came up with QSADA. And I thought I had made up something original and went and did a Google uh, Scholar search. And it turns out there's actually somebody else doing this. So um, not that inventive. But the quantitative guys would probably say it looks more like this or maybe even something like this. OK, good. There's a lot of qualitative fans in the audience. That's good. So what is the QSADA here? Well, it, in looking at kind of who's adopting what um, and, and looking around what, what news results might bring back, I found this. So, and the most interesting thing about this, besides there's graphs involved, is that the phrase bang with friends is also in the same sentence as religion. <laughs> so, but I mean, this is a startup that's used, that sees a practical application for graphs, right? And the biggest application so far is social, being able to connect, right? And obviously Facebook is there as well. They have their own proprietary type of graph that they're dealing with. Um, it's kind of mixed into a couple different things. Twitter also has something called FlockDB. So, um, and you're more than welcome to go use it, but there's a very specific use case for it, which is Twitter. So unless you're building another Twitter, it's probably not gonna do you that much good. And there is some quantitative evidence out there, and this is uh, from DB Engines uh, from last month. So you can see out towards the end, that green line going all the way up is their um, analysis of where uh, graphs are at this point in terms of interest. So this is a leading indicator of possibly where graphs are. And they use like search mentions, Google Trends, Stack Overflow technical discussions to arrive at these. And they use a baseline of 100 to kind of see where the popularity uh, index is. Again, this is a chart, not a graph. So why should you care? Why is this stuff, why should it be important to you as a developer or to your business? You have the NoSQL traits kind of covered. One of the things that I like the most is that it's whiteboard friendly. So when you're describing the model, 
this is how it's going to look inside of your graph database. When you're, typing, or when you're drawing it out for the business, this is where it's going to end up. And you can start to see, just in plain language, how things are connected. And when you compare it to relational databases, you start to see that relationships aren't really the primary goal inside of a relational database. You can't label it. Um, you can't really have a more than one type. But you can with a graph database. It's just as important as the objects that are connecting them. You have properties and labels on something. You have multiple relationships. So again, there's different types of relationships here. You have types that are partners, friends, colleagues. It comes with those properties inside of each one of those nodes. So you're, you're able to take relationships a little bit further than you would in a relational database. Uh, another point of contention is join hell. So if you like joins inside of joins inside of joins, then, you know, and I'm sure who has done something like that before and just wanted to pull all their hair out. Yeah, that kind of goes away when you start to look at graph databases, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. So the speed at getting connected data. Um, this will be uh, possibly a little point of contention, so I'll just refer back to the Mongo is, is web scale, um, and just remind everybody, if you're stupid enough to ignore X just against benchmarks, you can pipe everything to dev null, and your results are gonna be pretty fast, right? So in other words, your mileage is gonna vary once you do this experiment at home. So take 1,000 people with an average of 50 friends. Um, in a SQL join table, you end up with 50,000 records, right? Um, good on the math? Okay. So that's what it looks like when you try this uh, on a laptop just like this one. The My MySQL query time looks like this. Neo4j looks like that. There's the records return. And here's the depth, right? So when you're just talking about friends of friends, there's no difference. Friends of friends of friends, maybe a little bit, and when you start to get at node level four, then it's 10 seconds versus a consistent 0 0.07 seconds. You get to five, I mean, then it just starts to get ridiculous. So we'll take it a little bit further, a little bit closer to real world. You have a million people with an average of friend, 50 friends. I think, what does Facebook have? 1.2 billion people on there, so a little bit lower than that, but you still get the idea, right? 50 million records in your join table now. And here are the results when we start to compare them again. At depth two, not that big a deal. Depth three, we're, we're not using MySQL at this point, right? At least based on this sort of test. You get any further than that, we stop after one hour. If we get down to a uh, depth of five. And we're still pretty much the same on the Neo4j side. So how does this happen? Well, that's because the queries kind of look like this in a visual representation. So, um, Typically, when I give this talk, um, in a town where most of the people are there from it, so if you can imagine a stadium in your own hometown, and you're trying to um, get the people that are within 15 feet of you. In a relational database, you're counting everybody in the stadium to get at that number. In a graph database, you just care about the people that are within 15 feet of you, right? So that's essentially the performance. You're starting out with a node and not going any further than you have to. You can forsake all other records. So when does it not make sense? I had to do this slide. Please, <laughs> I had to do it. So it depends, right? You're always going to get that answer. It depends. Do you have a good relational model? If you've got, or other NoSQL model. If that's working for you, you don't want to switch. You've already put the time and effort into it. If you have a well-defined schema, you're probably not going to want to switch over. Um, this is where the questions, the, the best questions start to rise. Deep connections are a performance issue. If, you're use, if it's an employee um, database, you're probably not going to worry about that too much. But if you're talking about connecting employees with other employees, looking at their interests, uh, maybe who their uh, reporting relationships are, then the questions start to get a little bit more complex. And if you don't like lock-in, this maybe is not fair, but at least with relational databases, you're probably going to get SQL that you can take over to another relational platform, which you can't yet with graph databases. So as the J implies, it's uh, written for Java, or written in Java uh, for the JVM. Um, it can be embedded. There's also a uh, Spring library that's dedicated to it. 
Uh, but most people are using connecting over REST, and it's pretty straightforward. There are a number of language bindings that are out there, and here's just kind of a quick breakdown. These are all available and have been out for quite a while. So one of my favorite slides here. Uh, if you are on the Windows platform, they've taken out two steps for you and just boiled it down to one, because obviously the three were confusing the Windows users. Um, so you just download and run the installer, right? Click to win and just open up. By default, uh, it's on 7474 and just open up the UI. If you are using uh, C Sharp, um, that client has been developed pretty well. So a little bit on use cases here. So here's Glassdoor. Everybody familiar with Glassdoor? Okay. You have a question? Okay. Um, they have 600 million users on Glass inside connection or Glassdoor inside connections. It is a large social graph. It's not Facebook, but 600 million is a lot. Um, the difference is they're running it on five servers, so they have a highly available cluster with just five servers. Whereas Facebook, it's more than 800 million by now, but the low estimate is they have 10,000 servers running that uh, sharded cache MySQL option. Um, there's not everything is in there, but there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, that blew me away when I heard the CEO of Neo4j point that out. This is also a pretty interesting one, uh, Adobe. Uh, the security problems they had were not connected to this, by the way. Um, so they started with 1.4 in 2011, and they um, ran a test to see how uh, long it would take to get 250,000 records across all their regions. And by the way, they're running on uh, AWS on EC2. So when they first did it, it took about 23 hours uh, to get to all 40 nodes across all of the regions. Um, they invited Neo4j in, they fixed a lot of those problems, and now they can get 250,000 records to 40 nodes across the globe in about five seconds. So um, the evolution, and this is to point out the evolution of the development, right? It, it has grown up to the point to where it's running major organizations. And 53, does anybody use this? Okay, a bunch of developers probably wouldn't, I'm guessing. So this is more of a designer thing. Um, um, 53 makes this thing called paper. It's on your iPad. You can do sketches for designs and things like that. And they had this made with paper kind of stream that you can follow if you're a designer. And their goal was 5,000 requests per second. Um, and I think their audience is in, in the hundreds of thousands. And they've achieved 10,000 requests per second with less than 0.01 error rate and less than 50 milliseconds median response time. So it's being used, it's, it's definitely battle tested. So we'll deal with Cypher here a little bit and there's lots of matrix references so just deal with it. Um, a news feed would look a little bit like this. Uh, that's a little bit complex obviously for, for our slide here but you get the idea that news feeds kind of shape into a linked list and here's an example of kind of how a select statement might compare in Cypher. So this is prior to 2.0 and after 2.0. Uh, select star from user, everybody uses select star, right? I mean, that's pretty standard. Select star from user where first name equals Greg gives you all the users back that where their first name equals Greg. Uh, down here, here's the pre 2.0. So essentially you have a variable and you identify it as a node and the node type. You list its property and then you return that variable. A little bit easier, they, they're trying to get rid of this start option in the later versions of, of Neo4j. So basically you're, you're doing something what's called a match. So you're gonna match a user by their first name and return that. Here's what a join might look like. So you're trying to bring back uh, bar and foobar, the join table and one side of the join table and here's what it would look like in Cypher. So foobar is now converted from a join table up here into a typed relationship. So that's pretty close to a one-to-one -one in, in how you should think about relational databases and relationships in Neo4j. Join tables uh, become uh, typed relationships. What is Cypher? Uh, Cypher is uh, Neo4j's query language. They, um, Tinkerpop is a, um, another kind of um, I would say 
the collection of graph tools and they have something called Gremlin, which I think they use as DSL that they used a long time ago. But they've switched pretty much everything to Cypher in Neo4j. So that's pretty much the only thing that you're gonna see going forward. And now I am going to tempt the presentation gods. That's not what I meant to do. There we go. So this is the UI for Neo4j and yep, and tempting the presentation gods. You're not gonna be able to see all of this, I don't think. But I'll do my best here. I, did, I do want you to see this. Yeah. This is what I get for thinking this just works. So while I'm trying to figure this out, ponder this question. Who is more anxious right now, the presenter or the people in the audience? You're right. God, I'm just on a Mac here. Why isn't this working? Okay, so we'll just do it like this. So it allows you to save queries over here. And I'll hit this run option here. Hey, there we go. That's a little bit better. So if you've ever wondered what a linked list looked like, this is it. And this is essentially a news feed. And that's you can see the typed relationship here. And how you would handle the news feed like a Facebook or a Twitter is you'd have something like a next post, next post, next post relationship. So if you only wanted to get back the last 15, the first relationship would be called first post, and then you'd have 14 of the next posts. What's that? Yeah, I'll try here. And, um, you know, I was joking around with the Windows bit earlier. Let me bring the cipher up here. But installing Neo4j is literally a couple minute operation and opening up the browser and start and starting messing around with Cypher is pretty quick. They actually have uh, some save scripts over here. You can just click that and it'll throw data right into the graph database and you can get rolling. But for this example here in the um, news feed, it starts here with my for a profile ID, right? And I have something called a profile variable and a display profile. I've abbreviated it to DP. And I want to make sure DP is not suspended. And there's a thing called uh, with. It's part of the Cypher query language. And not to get too far into this, but with is kind of magical. It is, takes a large graph, and then it passes it down to the next query. And now you have a subgraph of the larger graph. So if you start to run into performance problems, this is probably one of the saviors. Like I had a seven second query that went down to like 100 milliseconds just by adding in some widths, essentially narrowing down the graph set. Okay. Sorry, there were more queries there, but that is a little too painful to go through. So uh, other graph databases, uh, we mentioned Titan. Uh, it is ACID compliant, but you need to use the Berkeley DB as the back end. Uh, there's Orient DB, the mix of gra uh, document and graph. It promises acidity. I haven't used it on a major project yet. I have downloaded and played with it a little bit, but I haven't tested it in the field. Uh, there's something called DEX, which I think is morphed into maybe Allegro graph or something like that. It was started, um, uh, I think it was the University of Barcelona in Spain. And then keeping with the matrix thing, Microsoft had something called Trinity. So I, I, I don't know there, it sounds too fishy. So a little bit on security. Um, anybody familiar with XKCD? So yeah, Bobby Tables, for those that don't know, uh, essentially someone named their student a SQL statement that made it drop all the tables in the, in the student database. And you know we've lost all our data and the advice is Sanitize your inputs. Okay, so now that we've gotten out of that away, Cypher injection is also susceptible to that. Use params or little bobby tables is gonna get you. Don't do this. Don't drop strings straight into some statement. You're gonna do something like this, right? 
So that's one of the security. If you take care of this, you're halfway there in terms of security issues. Uh, so the other <laughs> half is Neo4j doesn't have users, right? Like in a relational database. There's, there's no permission that gets fire, you know, wired up into some JDBC connection. If you can access it over a port, then it's yours to do whatever you want with if you know what you're doing. Um, but there are ways to kind of get around that, right? So if you're running on Amazon, if you're running on EC2, you can block ports, you can do other things like server authorization, security groups kind of mixed in with the whole port thing. Uh, and it must be configured for remote access. So by default, it blocks anything that isn't localhost if it's running on one instance, right? So code injection, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. So if you're being really cautious, you could just encrypt the whole file system if you wanted. That's what, another way to handle it. Um, but that's, that seems like a little bit of overkill for, for just you know basic kind of social applications. Uh, some of the other use cases um, that are out there besides social, there's the interest graph, so tags that may be tied back to a user. There's the intent graph, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. This is more predictive analytics. So if you spent the past couple of days looking at a group of tags that fit in a folksonomy or a taxonomy, there's a prediction that you might go for those same set of tags over the next couple of days, right? And that's useful in an application in terms of suggesting things to users. Uh, that also kind of follow along with the, follows along with the consumption graph. So kind of tying things that um, you're interested in, not just from a content perspective, but things that you've purchased, um, videos that you've watched, the list kind of can grow there. So a little bit back on uh, the caveats. IDs can be reused, so there's a default ID that gets assigned to nodes. Um, I think the upper limit is something like 64 billion, so if you run into that problem, you have a pretty good problem. Uh, and they, and uh, with a, there's a commercial version of it, you can contact them if that is an issue. Um, but the best way to handle that is to make a separate unique key, so some sort of combined ID. And it's only an issue if um, you're taking things out of the graph, if you're completely removing them from the graph, and you're relying for these IDs to be unique in some way. Um, that's when it becomes an issue. It's really the relationships that make the connections which you would most likely be used, used to, or um, you know, a lot of search depends on, upon the properties that are on each node. And shut down properly if you're working locally. Um, you can get uh, under the covers for indexing, it uses Lucene. So as if you've worked with Lucene and all, if you don't shut down properly, you can get corrupted indexes, and that's kind of a pain to deal with. So looking a little bit at the future, um, their uh, biggest goal, I guess, for this year is improving, getting it up and running in the cloud. So EC2, Azure are kind of their big targets. Uh, their platforms they're obviously concerned with, but those are the ones that they mention by name. Um, classifying, labeling of nodes, that is already out. Um, improvements to Cypher. Um, so they've removed Start, which kind of helps um, take, take down some of the conceptual issues, I would say. Uh, and they have the new web UI that's, that's just come out with, uh, with 2.0. Uh, one of the other things that they're focusing on is, so sharding's not real simple, um, but they're making it easier. So if you want to split things up for high availability, that's getting easier. So one of the biggest problems is uh, if you have dense nodes. So uh, Aston Kutcher has, what, eight zillion followers, right? He would have a lot of people connected to him on that single node, and that can affect performance. So one of the things they're able to do is kind of split that up so there's not just one local access point. So that concludes uh, the presentation. Unless there's any questions, I want to thank ApacheCon and also thank these three guys. These are um, the authors of the uh, Graph Database book. If you go to graphdatabases.com um, or www.graphdatabases.com, there's a free download there of this O'Reilly book and gives you a little bit deeper dive into graph theory. They talk, uh, it's called Graph Databases, but it really should just be called Neo4j. <laughs> That's where they work. Um, but I think they wanted to make it, you know, a little bit easier to access. And of course, there's this other book that's coming out I heard about, so you can check that out too. Uh, questions? Yeah. You said that the underlying data store would be 
for indexes, yes. Oh, for indexes. Mm -hmm. So that's for fast, just for fast lookups. Okay. So yeah, um, you are yeah. You're going to want to uh, make sure you know. There's at least you're going to need at least you know one typed relationship for it really to make sense to even use it, right? Um, and let's see, I, I can't really think of an example where that wouldn't work. Okay. Right. Yeah. There's some at, um, you know out of the box queries that you could find, and their documentation is top notch. By the way, um, there's still you w will need this book. I'm not going to deny that, but their documentation is still pretty good. Um, yeah. There's um, sorry. Uh, the first question you had talking about the relationships, like so, you're talking about degrees of relationship. So yeah. Um, the way that you can define that is in a cipher query, um, when you, um, if you're using a typed relationship, so let's say um, the relationship is knows, like I know you, if I wanna see relationships further out, um, you're going to append it with some sort of sequence, so it would start with zero, and if you just left zero after that, it would go on forever until it reached all, you know, uh, further in de degree, relationship that it could go. Typically you want to make it to where, like I showed the examples of the, uh, the news feed, like 15 degrees is as far as you want to go for it to, to be performant. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. So you said the differences between the other graphs? Um, so, uh, what, what, I'm sorry, what was that one again? The RD app? Oh, RDF, sorry. Um, so there is some connection there. I don't know enough about RDF to really speak intelligently on how, uh, it, how it compares, but there's, I would imagine there's gonna be some, um, some relationship towards it. So yeah, sorry, I couldn't answer that. Other questions? Yeah. What's your feeling on whether Cypher will have a standard that other databases use or whether it will hold on to it? That's a great question. Um, so it's unlikely that it'll become a standard um, unless there's enough support from, from the guys at Titan and, and from the guys at Orient to kind of let them take the helm, right? I don't, I mean, it would be nice, like, yeah? Do you think it's their choice, or do you think it's Neo's choice? Um, well, I mean, Neo's a commercial company, but they, they run under the Apache license. So I don't think they want to run too far afoul of the community that's gonna support them. Um, if pressured, or if, if there was enough interest, I'd say yeah, that Neo4j, or the Neo guys, uh, would, would be good with it. Um, you know, there would have to be Yeah, that's a tough question. They'd have to get rid of that damn name first, I think. Before they really, yeah, come on. Yeah. There are no such thing as stupid questions. Right. Okay. Right. So he guessed wrong, I think. Uh, well, no, I'm not, okay, you're, yeah, okay, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. So, I don't think it's the next big thing for Neo4j. We'll, we'll limit it to that context. But, I mean, they've invested so much time and effort to make Cypher do, do dances that they want to make it do. Um, there's, there's no reason why the community can't benefit from some of the things they've done. I just don't know how they're gonna be able to share that, some of that stuff back based on some of the commercial investments they've made. I, it maybe, I mean, it, I'd, I'd like to see interest from people who understand why you want to use a graph 
and go to Neil and say, hey, can, you know, w how can we make this happen? But right now, I've, just based on what I've seen anecdotally, it's um, probably ciphers the future, at least for Neo4j. Sparkle is good. Sparkle is good. Okay, other questions? You guys have been great. I really appreciate it. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.